brother. About five or six years ago, I was introduced to Robert Jones by one of my dear friends, Mike Snyder. And Mike said, do you know Robert Jones? Did I say Mike Jones? Do you know Robert Jones? I said, no, I've never heard of him. He said, you have to call Robert Jones because he is a writer. And friends that you have at Chapel Library use his material. And I introduced him to Chapel Library, and I want to introduce him to you at First Level Publications. So I said, well, let's give me his phone number, and I'll call him. So we had a wonderful chat. And in the end, we began to have this partnership with Robert Jones in which First Love has published now, I think, his 12th book, if I'm correct, the 11th or the 12th. So I asked him to um, see if he could finish the volume that he was working on, his latest book, in time for this conference. And by God's grace, he did. So I want to introduce to you his two latest books, uh, the, the recent one I referred to was just finished last week, Personal Revival, The Way of Holiness, a study on Psalm 138 and Isaiah 12. And the book that was published before that one is called Redeeming the Time, Reflections on Psalm 90. Both of these books, books are available on the back table. Uh, feel free to take a copy. If you also take a copy of our new catalog, we just published our new catalog, First Love Publications. These two books and all of our titles are in the catalog, again, on the back type table. And Bob has given me permission to call him Bob Jones. And so he's also told me that all of you are able to call him that. Bob Jones, of course. So Bob is a deacon in a Reformed Baptist church in Topeka, Kansas. He is a farmer and a prolific and gifted writer. And it is a blessing to have him as part of our ministry and as a partner with us. And he will speak to you today for about 30 minutes on the subject of the role of literature in missions. Brother Bob. Come, it will not tarry. 
Now, we can go straight to the application of the message that we're going to give you on the role of literature and mission from these two verses. And we can just uh, have a message in itself that way. But I'd like first to give you an exposition of the text, uh, verse 14 of Habakkuk 2 and the verses preceding it. And then also make the implications from that, from those verses as they do apply to uh, literature and missions. Uh, it may seem like, well, how can I do that if I want to mind the process? But I hope you'll follow me with your thinking and it will become clear as we go along. Now, in uh, Habakkuk's message, we won't have time there to deal with all of this in chapter 2, but we see it. It's a series of woes or divine curses which are pronounced against the Chaldeans for their violent and ruthless actions toward Israel. And uh, in verse 12, it says, Woe to him that buildeth a town with blood, and establisheth a city by iniquity. And Matthew Henry, in commenting on this verse, said, Woe to him that does so, for the towns and cities thus built can never be established. They will fall, and their founders be buried in the ruins of them. Babylon, which was built by blood and iniquity, did not continue long. Its days soon came to fall. And then, as we know, as David says in Psalm 92, verse 7, when the wicked spring as the grass, and when all the workers of iniquity do flourish, it is that they shall be destroyed forever. And then in verse 13, we're told how industrious and hardworking these Babylonians were to establish their plans and purposes. It says, the people shall labor in the very fire, and the people shall worry themselves for very vanity. All their toil is nothing because God is not in it. Uh, if the Lord built the house, does not build the house, they who build it labor in vain. And that's the principle that applies to anything that's done. And not only was God not in it, their labor was against God. It's positively evil. And so, just uh, whoever takes that position in his efforts in his work is bound to fail at work. Pharaoh, Nebuchadnezzar, Hitler, you name it. Whatever despot or despot has ever existed and persecuted Christ's people, he's come to his end, his demise. And it will continue to be that way, even as a brother brought out his message very plainly. And now verse 14, which is our text, proclaims that uh, it's certain that God will be glorified above all uh, opposing powers, all ideologies that oppose his word. It says, for the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. So all that these mighty people and enemies of the truth do, God will do above them. God will do greater than they. So we see that, uh, taking Pharaoh for example, when uh, God sent Moses and Aaron to, to him with some signs to perform before him, one of them was that Aaron would cast his rod down and become a serpent, and then he would be able to pick the rod up and be the rod again. Well, uh, Pharaoh's uh, magicians imitated that or duplicated that miracle. But what happened? We're told in Exodus 7 12. Aaron's rod swallowed up their rods. So that was the end of it. And then, uh, using another example from the history of Israel, uh, at the miracle of the Red Sea, we know that the children of Israel were spared while the Egyptians were drowned. And that knowledge quickly spread to all the nations in the land of Canaan when Israel was going to go in and uh, conquer them. And it was, it was said to the spies who went to Jericho that uh, by Rahab, who gave them housing, gave them protection, so as soon as we had heard these things, our hearts did melt, neither, was, neither did there remain any more courage in any man because of you, for the Lord your God 
He is God in heaven above and earth beneath. So when God does mighty things in putting down his enemies, that knowledge spreads quickly, and people fear God. They see this is, this is supernatural power. And then also, if we use the example of uh, Babylon falling, remember the situation of King Belshazzar is having this riotous party, and the fingers of God appeared on a wall writing his doom, writing his judgment, and says that, uh, and the joints of his loins were loose, and his knees smote one against another. So that man was full, full of fear of God, too, when the knowledge of truth came to it in the power of God. And then more in our own history, we can think of Adolf Hitler. Now his thought, his boasting, and his work was all to exterminate the Jews. But what happened? Well, he fell, and the nation, the modern day the nation of Israel, rose out of the ruins. There again, we see God. Uh, Overruling and for its glory. And uh, the last part of our text shows us this uh, metaphor. It talks about uh, the knowledge of the glory of God covering, uh, filling the earth as waters cover the sea or fill the sea. Now, uh, the idea of a covering is something that is spread over whatever's beneath it. And Psalm 90, uh, 105, verse 9 says, He spread a cloud for a covering. And the vast ocean is a perfect example of such a cover. Now, all, think of all the rivers that run into the ocean. They're full of impurities, uh, just waste, and things that would corrupt and defy any smaller body of water. But when you get into the ocean, they quickly sink to the bottom and they're never seen again. Well, that's the idea that, that God gives us about how he pardons our sins. In Micah 7 and verse 19, it says, I will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. And then Christian love is also told, it, told us that it is a cover. Uh, love covers all sins in Proverbs uh, 10, 12. And then also we're commanded in 1 Peter 4, 8, and above all things, have perfect charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. Now we're far from God in perfect love, but we are to love one another in such a way that our love actually covers so many sins if they're just a multitude of sins that are also forgotten, as it were. We don't hold, we don't make count of sins that are done against us. We forget them to cover in terms of our, our regarding them in others, our brethren. And We have also uh, the greatest covering of all provided for us is the righteousness of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. In Isaiah 61.10, He had covered me with the robe of righteousness, it says. And that one is perfect. Our love is not perfect, but it is a perfect covering, which we must have to be justified. Well, then what are the implications of, of this text in trying to open to you? to a, a literature ministry in missions. Well, there will be several. First, uh, as there are many uh, bloody, bloody kings who seek to uh, conquer the earth, so there are many false religions and evil ideologies which seek to advance themselves worldwide. And they all employ the printed page. For our people's minds are mastered, their bodies and souls become willing captives of the air. Now, just think of me. Muslims have their Quran. Mormons have the Book of Mormon. Jehovah's Witnesses have their Bible with the deed of Christ removed from it. Uh, Karl Marx, the father of communism, wrote his Communist Manifesto. And the German Friedrich Nietzsche uh, so swayed the minds of the leaders and people of Germany with his writings on nihilism and God is dead that two world wars resulted. <laughs> and great movements and monarchies are built on lies and sold out in the airs, which are certain to be burned in hell with the, those who uh, invent and promote them. So we see this like God warns the bloody kings that they're, they're going to fall. So these ideologies and lies will fall. Uh, 
give you a more recent example on any of these is 9-11, who set in, and henceforth from that day, we, we constantly hear of these Muslims who blow themselves up in, uh, in their terroristic work to destroy, kill, and murder. Well, you know, there has to be something in their mind. They're not stupid. I mean, they think like we think. I mean, the same process is in their minds, well, in their minds, they're taught and they believe that their heaven is wine, women, and song. So that probably gives them enough courage to do with it. But what do they find? Well, we don't find they wake up in hell. But that, that shows you the power of lie and power of error. But uh, those things all gather in, they all fall. Uh, so a second implication is just like uh, the Babylonians would work themselves as though they're in a fire, just uh, relentlessly and ceaselessly and diligently to accomplish their evil ends. So we know that people do similarly to advance their philosophies and their doctrines, of evil uh, doctrines through literature. Uh, how many of us have not had those witnesses come to our door? And they put us to shame many times with their uh, diligence. Or Mormon missionaries walk the streets of our towns and communities. And that's part of their work and service that they do, you know, to rise up in the ranks and do their, do their so-called duties. Uh, so we see that that's a common thing also, that it involves literature work. And we should not imitate their error, but we should also be likewise diligent in our needs. Army needs for literature. But then the third implication is that our text, which we have in Habakkuk, that uh, the earth should be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea, it gives us uh, something that we can compare to our duty. Now, our duty was set forth before us just now in the commission of Christ Go ye therefore and teach all nations. Well, that leaves no place on earth, uncovered or unreached. And we might think that's impossible. But what does our promise give us as an incentive that it is possible? Well, the earth should be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the water is covered with the sea. There's, no, there's nothing left in the sea that's not covered with water. And so that's, that should boost our courage, give us strength to go forward. And also, other promises of Scripture uh, continue to uh, cause us to walk when, when we, would, we would cease and we would stop. Like in the book of Revelation, we see the kings of the, uh, the earth make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings. And they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful in Revelation 17, 14. So uh, the war that's made against our king and our Lord is against us as well because we are with him. We want to be with him and continue with him and be faithful to him. And we know that he's not gonna he's not gonna be overcome, so we have hope of not being overcome in our work. And but then we, we look around and we see, look how many masses of people follow these false teachings and these false doctrines and, and buy into this false literature and are, are deceived by it. Uh, well, what, if, what, about the, uh, what about this? Well, I would say an answer to that. Whenever a man, woman, or a young person has once tasted that the Lord is gracious, and that's the verse in 1 Peter 2, 3, that they will want no more to do with the husks and half-truths of those who print and promote error. Mm -hmm. We have an example of this in the ministry of the Apostle Paul. If you want to turn with me to Acts chapter 19, Here's a scriptural case or example of how those who are silently converted are also converted away from false literature, false doctrines. Uh, I'll just read this because <coughs> I think it, the context is well to uh, think about. And uh, starting in verse 13 of Acts 19, and certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, 
took upon him to call over them which had evil spirits in the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, We adjure you by Jesus, whom Paul preaches. And there were seven sons of one Sceva, a Jew, and chief of the priests who did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, and who are ye? And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them and overcame them and prevailed against them, so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. And this was known to all the Jews and Greeks also dwelling in Ephesus, and fear fell on them all. And the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. And this is the one verse I want you to notice especially. And many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. Many of them also, which used curious arts, brought their books together and burned them before all men. And they counted the price of them, and they found it 50,000 pieces of silver. So, all well, these books were worth something, but it was just worth a big fire to these who had been converted. And so we can have confidence that not only like our Lord Jesus Christ will prevail, his truth will prevail with him, and his word will never be uh, never be put to shame. And we know that there's one clear testimony of Scripture where the glory of God is seen most, or where it is seen at all times, is seen in the face of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, it says in 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 6, For God who commanded, commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Amen. And so this glory shines in the heart of the man and the, he sees the face of Jesus Christ in the saving way. Uh, all the lesser lights in the world are like nothing to him. It's like comparing uh, a star in the night to the sun at, at new day. And so this is, this is the Christ that we have. And he will not be, uh, he will not be best. He is, he is all in all. Well, let us try to make uh, some applications specifically to the use of literature. Uh, let's go back to those verses that we first looked at in back at chapter 2. Uh, it says in verse 2, Write the vision and make it plain upon the table. Now, we just need to settle it in our minds. We, well, we cannot improve upon God's own method from the beginning. He has been pleased to preserve his truth in a written revelation. Now, if you go clear back to when he gave the law to Moses, he said, uh, The Lord said unto Moses, Come up to me into the mount and be there, and I will give thee tables of stone and a law and commandments as I have written. And this is the reason that thou mayest teach them. So, we must write the truth, we will teach it. Because men's hearts are both false and forgetful. They quickly forget what they do not want to remember, and they are prone to confuse what they do remember. So God has been pleased to give us a revelation in a book, and when the gospel was preached by his uh, apostles, by Christ's apostles, they recorded it in writing, at the command of the Lord and the Holy Spirit. The written scriptures, not word of mouth or tradition, forms the foundation for our faith. Mm -hmm. And then, when we are ministering this word, both hearing and reading are vital means of obtaining and increasing faith. Uh, Richard Greenham, who lived from 1535 to 1594, wrote, Reading rather establishes than derogates from preaching. For none can be profitable hearers of preaching that have not been trained up in reading the scriptures or hearing them read. Now, if this be true in our Western culture, where we've had the scriptures in our possession for several centuries, uh, how much more true is it in the uh, nations, developing nations? where these privileges have been lacking, or where they're just beginning to, uh, to be uh, now at this time. And it can easily be deduced that sound doctrinal literature is indispensable for making disciples in these nations. So therefore, let us print and distribute uh, 
from the vast library of uh, truth which has been left us by Christ's servants, his faithful servants for the past 2,000 years since his return to glory. And let us continue to write and distribute in our own day, time in our own day. For though so much has already been written, there's still time and place for more. There's always need for more. We can't say, well, there's enough. Let's just use what we have. And, you know, take it easy, in other words. And let somebody else do our work. No, we have to keep on writing. We have to keep on distributing in our time. Amen. And so then the second application would be to uh, look at verse 3. It says, for the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Go tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. Uh, now, uh, the scriptures here talk about waiting. Uh, I just want to make the point that waiting obviously involves patience. I mean, we all understand that. We don't get the results we want to see always immediately. Or we may not even see them in our own lifetime from our labors. But also, though it involves patience, it does not mean passivity. Like some people would say, well, we'll just wait and see what will happen. We're not, we're not waiting in that manner. We're waiting actively. We're doing all we can to promote the cause that we know is of God. And we're patiently waiting for the result. And uh, so then, should we be outworked and outdone by heretics who, uh, when we have God's, God on our, as we say, God on our side, and he is on our side, we have the truth, his very truth to distribute and to influence people with. So we should not grow weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall be, if we think. Amen. And then the third application would be, uh, let keep the home fires burning. Uh, and I'll try to, uh, Say what I mean by that. So, if the men of the world, we know that's true, all around us we see every day people that all the, from the time they wake up in the morning to the time they go to sleep at night, their mind is filled with worldly objectives and nothing else. That's, that's an unconverted man, that's a natural man, as we would say. And many of them are willing to work themselves uh, to exhaustion, many of them are willing to deny themselves sleep or other things, other comforts to promote their own designs in this world. In other words, Christ said, the labor for the meek which perishes. But should we be put to shame for our lack of daily zeal for the furthest of Christ's righteous kingdom? I think we should not be. Then we need to remember the order of, I say, at home, our home fires, we need to remember the order of his commission. In Acts 1 8, you shall be witnesses unto me, unto me both in Jerusalem and in all of Judea and in Samaria and in the uttermost part of the earth. So remember, you're as much a debtor to one lost soul of one person who lives near you or who works at your workplace as you are to the thousand who are overseas. Uh, it's a principle that applies universally to all souls. But we are debtors to, to their souls. Paul said, I am better both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. So as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. And I think that we could also make an application of that regarding literature, since that's the emphasis of this message, is that we should also be ready to put something in somebody's hand mm. which will help their soul to read. If, if so be the opportunity is ours and the place to do it. And may we do all that we do with the prayer of faith in our hearts that God will own it, he'll bless it, and that we will even see the fruit of it in our arm. May God help us. Amen.